that our engineers were doing to something we all became, uh, that became a crutch for all of us in our daily productivity. But it went a little too far too fast, and there was too much capital available to spur those business models. I can imagine that four or five or even ten competitors in online uh, shopping sites, uh, in B2B transaction goods or whatever, may be appropriate. We had 100 or 200 in every category. That doesn't work in any industry, no matter how good or how bad the capital infusions or the technology. We've come through that hype curb. We've gone through our trough of disillusionment. And the reality is, while we all kind of forgot about it, the network's been growing. More people have been using it. It's been globally expanded. And reality is, we're now on the right side of the curve. From our perspective, even in the middle of those crashes, we saw uh, queries on our databases grow by over 100% every year, online merchant sales over 200%, and daily email services over 100% as well. So we knew it was coming, but we didn't know what for. We now believe that these next five years will actually be dictated by real usage driven by consumer demand. Whether it's VoIP access lines, wireless content, Wi-Fi access, or RFID uses in the supply chain, we are about to see some very high growth rates in some businesses that are not just there to return money to investors of early business plans, but in fact to drive productivity into the U.S. economy and to drive uh, new revenue and products growth uh, for consumers. So that sounds like a great story. I should finish there, and everybody will be happy, and we'll finish our lunch, and life will go on, and you'll all go back, and we'll rewrite the telecom app, and life will be good. However, a lot can go wrong still. And this is the double-edged sword. When so much promise exists in one of these new transformational infrastructures, there becomes a risk that we can't deliver or fulfill that, that potential. So what could go wrong? Reliability. We saw it last year uh, in a cascading effect from the Midwest through the eastern seaboard on electronic power grid. It wasn't an internet problem. It wasn't a terrorist attack. It was just bad planning. When these networks are interconnected, anything we do right, can impact our neighbors, and it can cascade across the U.S. or the world right, in a matter of minutes. You see this not just with reliability. You see it also with security. The bad guys are getting smarter. They're going after the money. The threats are more complex. They're multidimensional in their nature, and they're harder to track. As a security vendor, that makes me smile about our business opportunity. As an operator of critical infrastructure in the United States, I'm scared every day. We have 500 to 1,000 attacks on our networks daily in the VeriSign data centers. We've repelled them all, right, to date but we're worried about that one packet of death that comes through and cascades through our systems. And we do believe it's a possibility. So we have to get better about dealing with the security threats. We need to build in the digital world what we've had in the physical world for years and years and years, early warning systems. We need to see it coming. We need to protect ourselves before it knocks down our door. Complexity. We're talking about a billion and a half devices connected to these IP networks by 2007. The complexity of all the protocols, GSM, CDMA, and others in cellular, Wi-Fi around broadband, or WiMAX that's coming, and of course, the realities of connecting networks from disparate providers to disparate uh, countries, right, creates a complexity that we have to overcome. The only way to do that is at the core, not at the edge. This notion of push it out to the edge will go away for a while as we have to make the core smarter. Regulation, and I stand in front of a group of people who understand this probably better than I, we need to understand first. We need to experiment and explore. We need to promote innovation right, to drive these new services in the market because the benefits are there. And then we need to regulate based on the problems we find. I think in this world, as we look at telecom reform again, as we think about internet addressing, as we think about security and Sarbanes-Oxley expanding its role beyond financial controls now into IT, we need to be very, very careful. 
This is not the time, as we're getting into the second decade of this transformation, to regulate before we understand, right, and to go before we actually see the benefit. And then innovation, and this is probably a black mark on the industry that we're a part of. There are at least a dozen protocols that we have called internet standards. Some of them have existed since 1995. None of them are adopted. And they can drive great new uses. IPv6 expands the addressing space on the internet. Every device in the world, including cell phones, can have its own unique IP address. And we can think of many new products and services that can be there, both for the benefit of the consumer and for the security of the nation. DNS security, electronic numbering, right? I, I internationalize domain names. A full 65% of the world's billion internet users do not speak English as a native language. Yet today, domain names all exist for the most part in ASCII character sets that are, uh, that show up even in China as the, as in English words, right? We have to recognize it as an international network. We have to push forward on these standards and innovation has to be promoted. We fully believe that we have to get this right this time. There are global opportunities for business in supply chain, in better business productivity, in new IT services and telecom services. But it is also the foundation for reinventing healthcare. It is also the foundation for reinventing government, education, and family. Using these networks in a way that we can take them for granted, that we can share information securely, and that we connect and find somebody when they want to be found in the appropriate way and on the appropriate device is paramount to driving the kinds of Im improvements we want to see in patient to doctor consultation, in fast diagnosis, in uh, early and indications of poor prescription usage. So this matters in e-health and it matters in government services and it matters in education. As you know, the President's talked about uh, backing digital health records. We're talking about a national health information network. We've got the HIPAA legislation, and we've got industry initiatives to deal with authentication across different domains and boundaries. These are important initiatives to get right. So in summing up the calls to action out of this talk, one is promotion of innovation. We stalled as a country, we stalled as an industry, between 2000 and 2003. We took great pleasure in talking about how bad things were and how wrong we all were, right? And we forgot that if we kept innovating through the bottom, right, we would be in a world where we would start to see the benefits accrue. We need government leaderships and pol policies that encourage infrastructure investment, innovation, and ownership by the private sector of these infrastructures in a way in which we have the obligations to work with the public sector around security and around transparency and around privacy, but where we can use our innovative skills to drive the benefits of the network to where they need to be. Public-private funding and support for these new technologies, uh, industry-led standards, and technology-agnostic platforms. We also need to enable a culture of security and trust. Everything we just talked about in the last 20 or 25 minutes, I could have given this speech three years ago. right? Now, the realities were, we didn't know what we didn't know. The realities were, much of the economics had not been worked out. But, as you've seen from the earnings statements of most of the technology companies over the last two to three quarters, we're beginning to get back into a world where IT is important, where telecommunications is valued, and where these new services are actually drivers of growth instead of cost containment. What we don't have yet is a culture of security. We talked about our children. I have teenagers. They use the internet more than I do. They know how to program their cell phones better than I do. They download ringtones. They talk in chat rooms and the rest. So the good news is that generation takes the network and wireless for granted. The bad news is that generation has not yet embraced the notion of being uh, secure on the network and of good stewardship uh, of their machines and the rest. So it will take another generation. We need to get into the schools now, and we need to begin educating on not just what the network can do to improve education, but what the uh, individuals, kids growing up to be adults, need to understand about their obligation uh, into society when they're stepping on the network, the same as their obligation to society when they step on the streets. 
So we need best practices to be created and adhered to. We need to prioritize the development of authentication systems. What we're dealing with today, spam, phishing attacks, this identity theft, viruses and the rest, much of it could be uh, eradicated with good authentication. Knowing who's on the wire, knowing either so knowing what's coming across, knowing who sent it, and damn it, not letting anything on that shouldn't be there. Right? Now, it is a big, users will always choose ease of use over better security. It is time that we made security easier and better to use than today's existing systems. VeriSign's been involved with a group called iSafe here, Terry Schroeder, their CEOs in the audience somewhere here, an initiative to get kids in schools to have second factor authentication so when they go into a chat room, the chat room participants know that that's a t a really a teenager or a child and the age has been verified and that child knows that everybody they're talking to is also of the same uh, gender, the same age, whatever it may be. These are the kinds of things we need to drive. It starts with the schools. We're not going to make a lot of money out of doing this, but it's probably one of the most important things we can do to raise that awareness over the next decade about what's going on with security and these networks. We think there's a lot, tremendous amount of benefits that get derived from going where we are today to going to this new intelligent world. A fight for work and family balance that we all strive or we all have today moves to one of ease of work and family blend, being able to deal with things in minutes or seconds, right, that allow us to get back to our family, being able to share those moments with our families, even though we might be remote from them. Uh, a global label market goes to a global talent market where we went from primarily blue collar to primarily white. Uh, educational divide becomes an educational thrive, where we can take the best practices, the best teachers, the best curriculum, and we can share them with everyone, not just in lower performing school systems here in the U.S. or in rural areas, but in, in countries like Jordan where we've taken at Cisco's leadership and put internet connections in classrooms and seen children there raise their level of awareness of the world's uh, issues and of technology and what it can do for their, uh, for their own country and for their lives dramatically. So this is an important step. Putting intelligence in the network isn't about driving just economic benefit to telecommunications providers and IT services, right? This is about raising the level of uh, the standards of living around the world by utilizing these technologies and driving them through as a foundation for improving education, government, and healthcare. So in conclusion, we think the next great transformational infrastructure is here. It's called the Internet and IP networks. Convergence is no longer on the horizon. It's here and it's in the palm of your hand. Intelligent infrastructure is the next catalyst. These 10 years have been good at times and tough at times. The next 10, we should benefit dramatically from all that build out. New and real opportunities are emerging. You're starting to see it, like in wireless content, mobile entertainment, fixed line and mobile convergence. But we've got to push farther with security and trust and really the education of this next generation who will be the stewards of this country right, as, as we get through all this. Thank you. And I'm sure some level of personal peril, we're now going to take some questions. So. There's two microphones here at the front of the room if anybody wants to go. I knew doing this at lunch would be better for that. People are still eating. That's great. Good. Great, thank you. Be a good place. <laughs> so, um, so I'm Andrew McLaughlin from Google. Um, so I just want to, I hate to strike a discordant note, but yes. I do want to, I mean, I want to press you on one of the things you keep saying, and it may be just we're using the same words to talk about two different things, but as, a, as sort of a pure play internet company, yeah. the last thing that we want is intelligence in the network in the sense of complexity, <laughs> I, I'm, uh, you know, in yeah. the sense of complexity, meaning uh, for example, discordant standards that you have to program around, uh, barriers between us and the users who want to access us through their, their mobile devices, their computers, and so forth. Um, so can, can you elaborate on a little sure. bit what you mean? Because when I hear intelligence network, I hear telecom, PSTN, you know, uh, intelligent routing, that kind of thing. Uh, and if you can calm me down on that point, I'd be great. Sure. I, well, I'm not sure I'll calm you down. We, we either are semantically different or we are... 
uh, absolutely, absolutely in disagreement. Uh, let's figure that out with my answer. So we believe that network infrastructures go through a sine wave, right? And that sine wave is really the development of core standards and interfaces, right, begin in the middle and then get pushed out to the edge as they become standardized and ubiquitous and as they be really in many ways become commoditized. And I think if you look in history at many, many network developments, the reality is we started with central control, then we with dumb endpoints, then we moved to smart endpoints, and then a whole other level of, of whether you call it complexity or you call it uh, application interfaces comes in and we kind of bring back central control again for a while. So we don't think complexity and intelligence are synonymous. We think putting intelligence in the network means that you at Google don't care what device that end user is on, whether it be a cell phone, whether it be a, a laptop, whether it be a PC connected by a fixed line connection or a Wi-Fi connection. So the intelligence is there to remove the complexity from the endpoint, right? And so I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing in Google's perspective. We see it as a good thing in such that um, you are homogenizing, if you will, the interfaces in such a way that it doesn't matter whether it's GSM or CDMA, it doesn't matter whether it's Wi-Fi or DSL, right? All of that kind of goes away and the user takes control of provisioning what they're on, when they get the information, and whether or not someone on the other endpoint who's authenticated can reach them. So I'm not sure if we're in agreement or not, but we do see complexity com increasing and we see intelligence as the only way to make it invisible at the endpoints. I see the rest of the audience was aroused by that commentary, so we'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>